independent thoughts, independent life. This is Chad Benson. This is the Chad Benson Show. My name is Craig Collins filling in. I will be with you a lot over the next few uh, days, I guess, next week and a half or so, holiday season. Chad is on a much-deserved extended vacation. There's so much to talk about, by the way. I would love to open the show and talk about stimulus, talk about the debate going on for the stimulus package right now, because I truly think the way in which it's being perceived in the media is tremendously interesting compared to what we've heard for quite a while. But I, I can't. I can't. And I'm upset that I can't. And nobody can. And that's part of my criticism of the stimulus thing. I'd like to hear more about it in the world of news. And yet I myself can't avoid the pardon conversation. I can't get anywhere. We have to talk about it. We have to talk about the presidential pardons that took place yesterday. And I want to say this before I get into it, because I've heard this on social media before uh, when filling in on this show or just in general, that if you say certain things, you are perceived as a Trump fanatic, a Trump lover. You know, like this Trump loving guy is on the show right now and I can't stand him. And then the opposite is true if you say even remotely anything to the contrary. And I know that these are people that are on the far sides. I know there's a whole lot of people. I hope there's a whole lot of people like myself that feel they can perceive things on both camps, uh, be in the middle on a lot of things, and really try to understand it better. Uh, But as I talk about this, and as I do make fun of the media for the way in which they are covering the Trump pardons, uh, and I even have a list of other presidents who had controversial pardons. By the way, Bill Clinton did some things. Uh, We can dive back into those if you want to. But Bill Clinton, he had a a ton of different sleazy, odd things happen during his administration. Uh, You know what I'm talking about, but also his pardons. At the tail end, he even pardoned family members, much like Trump did yesterday, in some of the people that were pardoned, uh, Jared Kushner's father, Charles, uh, being one of them. But before we get to any of the uh, any of the rest of it, let's actually hear from Roger Stone, one of the individuals who gained a pardon. He was on Tucker Carlson uh, yesterday, and you can feel however you want about Tuck, but Raj was on the show, and he, he got to react immediately to the pardon because according to both of them, uh, when this interview took place last night, Roger hadn't officially been notified. So let's try to get this audio here on the show uh, real quick. i got to make sure that I'm hitting all the buttons correctly and go ahead. Nope, it's not going to happen right now. We have an audio issue. I'm going to have to fix that in just a second. Uh, But as I do that, I do want to say this, too, uh, because this is important to me. Uh, And I I know that I'm about to, and I'm not necessarily being critical of the pardons themselves, um, or I guess I'm not exactly excusing, I'm not exactly approving of the pardons themselves. I just think the way that the media covers all this is, is the big part of the problem, the big part of the split for people, you know, um, but here, let's try to get to Tucker this time. We wanted to get it directly from Roger Stone. So we're pleased to have him join us right now by Skype. Roger Stone, congratulations. If this is in fact true, you're dressed for the occasion. I'm glad to see. Um, is this true? Have you been pardoned? Um, I believe it is true. Um, my attorney has now checked with the White House counsel and we have assurances that the media reports are accurate because it was on CNN. So therefore, you know, it's a high probability that anything there is not true. But uh, Tucker, we're very happy. I, I have uh, an enormous uh, debt of gratitude to God Almighty for giving the president the strength and the courage to recognize that my prosecution was a completely politically motivated. OK, so there uh, <laughs> I love the fact that Tucker comments on how Roger is dressed. And I know this is radio, so you couldn't see it. But Roger was dressed like Roger Stone. That's an everyday Roger Stone outfit, uh, in all honesty. Uh, but as they're discussing that, Roger points out. I think the biggest defense that President Trump would use or anyone else would use, that the investigation itself was politically motivated. It was motivated to take down the president, the president only, and all the things discovered, whether or not they were actual crimes, which Roger Stone, Paul Manafort, people may have committed. Paul Manafort, uh, taxes are a thing. I'm just letting you know. Uh, those are Those individuals are being pardoned because of their involvement in the Russian hoax, which is what the president and a lot of people certainly feel it is. Certainly people on the right, Rick Santorum, uh, spoke about this earlier, got in kind of a fight uh, on one of the other news organizations with John Harwood, which was fun to fun to watch, too. Uh, but as all this is going on, as everybody's talking about it, the, the truth is the reason that this happened, at least from the position of the president, and this is my assessment of it, is that he's pardoning everyone who treated him nicely. Uh, obviously, Michael Cohen, no pardon. Uh, I've noticed that and a couple others. But everybody who treated him well during the investigation, who didn't speak, who didn't talk. <laughs> and I'm not saying that they know things. And they, they kept those things themselves, which a lot of people on the left are saying that that's it, that they, they kept things a secret. And so now they get out. Now the, the, you know, the sleaziness is complete. Actually, you know what? Let's go to that. Uh, this is Morning Joe talking about the sleaziness of this president. And I just think this is tremendously interesting because this is my point. 
whether or not we want to continue to debate the pardons, why the president would execute them, if they're the kind of thing that other presidents in the past have ever done of any kind. And again, Bill Clinton, there's, there's a lot of things there. Um, but as we talk about all this, I think the more important thing to discuss is how difficult it is for people that listen to your show, that watch your, your TV station, that whatever it is, to digest it if they have an opinion already. If you've ever been in an argument with anyone, right? Like if you've ever started an argument, maybe it's someone you love and care about, or it's some jamoke on the street that said something and you wanted to get in an argument with them. You know the worst way to win said argument is to just bring your emotional level to a 25, to just just ramp it up, to go way beyond the 11, uh, to go way up to the 25 as far as the things you're saying. I mean, we've all apologized to someone after a fight because we said stuff we didn't mean. We've all been like, yeah, I got emotional there. I said, I said some things. I called you sleazy six times uh, like Morning Joe is about to do with the president. And the truth is that if you want to have this conversation rationally, if you want to talk about whether or not a pardon should have happened, whether or not these individuals were guilty of crimes that, that mean they should spend more time in prison, uh, Roger Stone already out, by the way. His, his sentence was already commuted, so he was already out. He, he didn't actually get freed from a jail anywhere. Um, but as, as we go through that part of the conversation, it becomes easier for people that disagree with you to hear you if you don't add a lot of other crazy into the conversation. Let's see how Morning Joe did. I know you're a Spinal Tap fan, right? Oh, I even forgot about this. I love the fact that he takes the super long road to reference that Spinal Tap thing, the dialing something up to an 11, which he's accusing uh, the president of doing as far as sleaziness and, and horrible corruption goes. And in all honesty, like the way in which you discuss this, uh, Joe, to me feels like your emotional spinal tapping like crazy. Sure. Remember when sure. Derek was explaining uh, to Rob Reiner how his amp uh, was louder because it went up to 11? <laughs> yeah. Turned it up to a- The longest explanation of that ever. All right, finally get to the point, please, sir. 11. The Trump administration yesterday, man, I, <laughs> you didn't think it was possible, but they turned the sleaze factor. Up to 11 and parting like the sleaziest gang of 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 just just scum, just scum, just terrible. So if you are someone who disagrees with Joe's point to to start his show and the guest that he's going to have on, who certainly agrees with him, by the way, do you continue to hear any points he makes when he starts the argument that way? When you you know, if I was looking at you. And I told you, I disagree with you on something that you just decided to do. This would be like if Morning Joe actually got to interview the president. And you looked at the person, you're like, you're a sleazy, sleaze bag of a sleaze person. And here's the reasons why. No one's going to hear it. You can't get punched with seven insults and then keep your mind open to the criticism. It's really, really sleazy. And, you know, everybody expects Donald Trump to act in the sleaziest <laughs> way possible because he's been the sleaziest president in American mm-hmm. history and these sleazy yeah. pardons and okay. his sleazy presidency the way you would expect his sleazy presidency to be ended. See? I mean, we didn't we didn't take a second back. We didn't pull back from this at all. No producer in, a, in Joe's ear being like, you know, you could drop the word sleaze. I, I know you're trying to make a point, but... uh. You're kind of hitting it a bit bit too much here. Uh, Let's go to some of the other audio. Let's go to some of the other around-the-horn things that happened. Uh, I love this open, by the way. Uh, This is probably my favorite open of the day. Uh, Well, yesterday, to any TV show, MSNBC, uh, Ali uh, Velshi. And the the way he said that, uh, it just, it's crazy to me because I think he put the emphasis on the wrong syllable. I think he paused one too many times. But here's how he opens his show. Rich, white crooks of America, your time has come. If you're rich, if you're white, if you're a man. That's what I mean right there. If we go back to just those three pauses, it's I know that he's trying to make a, a greater point about the people who got pardoned, which I'll play the rest of the clip in a second. But when you when you pause after saying that people are going to get in trouble, people are going to jail, and then you just say three different adjectives. If you're rich, if you're white, if you're a man. I feel like he's saying every man's going to jail. Every white guy's going to jail. Every white person maybe is going to jail. And everybody who's rich is going to jail, and that's, again, too harsh of a take to get me to listen to the rest of the points. But go ahead, finish your point, Allie. If you've been convicted of a crime, and of course, if you're loyal to Donald Trump, you get a pardon. You get a sweet, sweet pardon. You get out of it. See, but he wasn't even he wasn't even specific about the crime thing at first, back when he's talking about who's going to jail. If you're rich, if you're white, if you're a man. Uh, you're pausing a tad too much, bud. You got you to get to the other things that they might have done in order to just throw people in the clink. Uh, real quick, I've read, I've referenced it a couple times. I might as well say it. Uh, Bill Clinton, during his presidency, he uh, used the pardon quite a few times in controversial ways. He used it to 
to pardon Patty Hearst, to pa- pardon the people that were affiliated with the Weather Underground group. That was all in 2001. Uh, in 2001, he also pardoned his half-brother. That was on his last day in office. Uh, Roger Clinton, who was convicted of a 1985 coke, uh, cocaine trafficking uh, thing. And then also, of course, the the freeing of different people. The WikiLeaks thing was actually Obama. Uh, Obama freed Chelsea Manning, which was in 2017, uh, one of the sources for WikiLeaks, uh, obviously giving a lot of valuable information to to people that shouldn't have it as far as the protections of our country. And then even some terrorist groups. There were terrorist groups, the Puerto Rican terrorists, the FALN uh, group, that in 99 and 2017 were pardoned by both Clinton and pardoned by Obama. These were things that actually happened. I, By the way, no one mentions Ford pardoning Nixon as controversial, but I guess it's out there. Uh, the New York Times or the New York Post, excuse me, put that out there. And then number one, Mark Rich. Mark Rich was a, a last day pardoned by the President Clinton as well. He was a billionaire fugitive. Uh, he was definitely, definitely a, a sleazy person, according to a lot of people. This is something that's happened before. And you will see takes that say it's not, that no other president has abused power the way that Trump's abusing it. And I know there's still time left for him to up the ante more. Uh, but as this all goes, I will tell you that, that if we dive into this fairly, if we dive into this accurately, and again, I want, I want to preface everything I say on the show today and everything I've just said, I don't necessarily agree with the pardons. And I know that some people will hear me as a Trump fanatic just by, by laughing at the crazy, craziness of the media. Uh, but that's not the point. The point is, as we discuss and go through all of this, we can't be 100 percent just uh, hyperbolic to the T and then actually be taken seriously. It's just not possible. Try to do it in your own life with a conversation with anyone on any topic. Be as hyperbolic as you possibly can and see if anyone pays. Attention. I don't even care if it's something you're 100 percent accurate about. You can be factually 100 percent correct. And if you scream nonsense at someone before you start saying the actual valid points, no one hears you. Greg Collins filling in on the Chad Benson Show. Don't let the Washington Beltway strangle you. This is where the exhausted majority comes to refuel, realign, and reevaluate. This is Chad Benson. This is the Chad Benson Show. My name is Craig Collins filling in Chad on a much-deserved, much-needed vacation. He will be back in the new year. Uh, I, I think it's really interesting that we're not talking enough about the stimulus discussion, the stimulus move by the president. Uh, obviously, the, the much-debated package that took way too long uh, to get past it all, the $900 million package, uh, $900 billion, whatever the amount of money is out there. I think it's billion, actually, uh, that's out there in the world right now, uh, potentially being passed, is something that is significant, um, certainly for many, many Americans, and yet to the President of the United States, didn't go far enough. And what I find so tremendously interesting about that and the way in which so many people react to it in the world of media or wherever, uh, certainly in the world of politics, is like this is as far to the left as you get as far as a reaction, the right, the Republican side, certainly in the Senate, was the one that was trying to pare back a lot of this for months and months and months. McConnell uh, fighting every way he could to get this to be uh, what he believed responsible, what he believed to be appropriate and not overspend in that department. The president wants to see stimulus checks to every American that are $2,000 a piece, uh, 4000 for a couple. If you have kids, you get even more money. Uh, right now, the package is about 600 bucks a person, so substantially different numbers. And Nancy Pelosi, someone who I don't think has ever seen a Trump headline and been as happy about it as this one, jumped immediately up, probably in her chair. Uh, she's trying to get something passed so that we can actually, um, you know, move on from there. I think that something already got blocked, though, uh, in the House, so it didn't work out the way that Nancy had hoped. But there was there was hope, at least on the left, that they could they could immediately pass something. Uh, at least in the lower of the two um, um, parts of our, our political structure, so that the Senate could then vote on this as well and try to get something passed so the president would, in fact, sign it. Uh, but what I find so tremendously interesting about all this is that the argument that the president has made is one that the left was making for a while, and there's no attaboys. There's, there's no, you know, thank you for this, sir. We're talking about the, the pardons. We're talking about everything else. And then you, like, dive into it. Elizabeth Warren had put up, I think, on her social media page right after the the first uh, stimulus uh, agreement actually was made uh, was that, you know, it was not enough. Congress just passed a stimulus, and it is just not enough relief. We need to do more in a Biden administration. I don't know what the music is. And to understand why, 
Let me break down the economic alphabet. No, I'd rather you don't break that down, actually, Elizabeth. I don't know what that music is behind her either. I find it entertaining. But this this was the reaction from, from Jump for everybody that was on the side of the aisle that is not the side of the president's that 600 bucks was not enough, that they're going to try to pass another package once Biden takes over. And obviously Biden is going to try to fight for that, but maybe he's going to see some some pushback is certainly from from GOP members that obviously the the runoffs happening in Georgia are tremendously tied to why people might be motivated certain ways to get things done. All of this is connected. And yet the president of the United States, the, the final voice after Democrats have given up, they've conceded all of their desires to, to make things bigger that that weren't as you know weren't as significant as they thought. Uh, then they go all the way to the to the president. He says, "No, let's try to work on this harder." And I just don't get it. I don't get how we ignore this. And actually, I think I even saw Al Sharpton who went on TV to talk about the pardons. He had like a drive by against the uh, against the stimulus. And I'll probably play more of this audio later. But let's see if we can find the just the drive by portion of how the stimulus is another thing that the president has screwed up. Putting on hold for Christmas. The uh, people that need some kind of relief during this pandemic, during uh, Mm. COVID-19. So let's look at how despicable this person is. Yeah. I mean, that was someone asked Al Sharpton what he thought of the pardons. And he threw the the stimulus shot at the tail end of his answer when all the president has done, at least the way I've perceived it so far. And again, you can call me a Trump lover if you want to, because I'm defending this point or or not. Uh, I don't care. Uh, the truth is that all I've seen so far is he wants to have bigger stimulus checks to Americans. And that's where, you know, do we wind up being more uh, financially, fiscally conservative? Do we wind up finding a way to to contain the amount of spending? Is this going to cost us in the long run? All those arguments would be valuable arguments to be had. No one's having any of those. We're focusing on how terrible, sleaze, baggy, whatever we want to say the president is. And, and no one cares about the fact that he stood up for Americans and tried to make the stimulus a little bit a little bit bigger. Uh, in his opinion, and that that's going to be a problem of some kind. But this is uh, just crazy craziness. Uh, it is Christmas Eve, though, so I, I think we have to have more fun on the show. I don't think we'll be able to not have uh, you know fun throughout the day. So maybe we just forget about politics for a bit. Maybe you and I can get in that trust tree together and not care about politics, because it might be nice to talk about some other things. Uh, seals are in the news, and I mean the actual animal. Uh, that's something that I find tremendously interesting. There's a guy who lives with his ex-wife and and other people. All that coming up in a bit. Craig Collins filling in. Chad Benson Show. Independent Thoughts independent life this is chad benson this is the chad benson show my name is craig collins filling in happy christmas eve merry christmas eve it is a wonderful wonderful time to have a holiday like this obviously travel is once again discussed much like it was around thanksgiving uh, which is time i was in and actually depending on where you live uh, they're saying some places did see a fairly significant spike in coronavirus cases and in the death toll other places didn't see it quite as as badly as the Armageddon people on on social media and on television uh, told you it was going to be. So I I hope for a very safe, uh, very happy holiday for everyone out there. Uh, But the holiday travel conversation is much discussed. And one of the reasons I guess it's so in the news, uh, other than just the fact that everybody has a certain take and everybody will will tell you what to do, uh, is this story about Dr. Deborah Burks. And this story is a couple days ago. I think that she actually did a podcast interview the other day uh, where she talked about her retirement and I want to say this before I get into the, the topic itself. I don't necessarily agree with the idea that the most prominent doctors in this whole conversation, uh, Dr. Fauci, Dr. Burks, are political operatives. I know a lot of people think that. I know, I'm not telling you you're wrong either. I want to make that abundantly clear. I just don't believe it. I, doctors are very, very uh, scared people uh, very, very often. Um, and that's why you get a second opinion. You have one doctor tell you one piece of medical medical advice even as high ranking, as, as high value as a Dr. Fauci, a Dr. Burks, as successful as those individuals. And you can go and get a second opinion. There's nothing wrong with it because people will say all kinds of things based on their medical expertise. But the, the problem is that Dr. Burks said one thing and then did something else. She went and spent time with her family around the Thanksgiving holiday, separate households, spent time together in another house that they own. She traveled to do all this. And she's very upset because... 
you know, uh, the media and or, I guess, just individuals on social media, where have you, went after her and went after her to the extent that they dragged her family into it. And for that reason, she'd like to retire. And I want to reiterate that I don't believe in the medical professional slash political operative thing to this degree. But I, I do think that this this is obviously something that would make people upset. Dr. Burks, you should be aware of that and understand why, because what you asked them to do is something you were incapable of doing. And the reasons you give at the tail end of this interview uh, that was provided to me, uh, this audio that I'm going to play for you here, are the same reasons every other American who wanted to travel would probably give. Every other American that wanted to see family members, wanted to hop on a plane, try to do it safely and be somewhere for the holiday, people who are now going to travel for Christmas. At the end of the interview, you excused your behavior in, in a way and excused the behavior of your family members in a way that I think everyone who's upset about this story would also do. Let's hear from her. I will be helpful in any role that people think I can be helpful in. Um, and then I will retire. I, I will have to say as a civil servant, I will be helpful through a period of time. And then I will have to say that it, this experience has been a bit overwhelming. It's been very difficult on my family. I think what was done in the last week to my family, you know, they didn't choose this for me. You know, they've tried to be supportive, but to drag my family into this, um, when it's my daughter hasn't left that house in 10 months, my parents have been isolated for 10 months. Um, they've come deeply depressed, as I'm sure many elderly have, as they've not been able to see their sons, their granddaughters. Um, my parents haven't seen their surviving son for over a year. These are all very difficult things. Yes, they are. Yes, they are, Dr. Burks. They're all very difficult things. You know what's interesting, by the way? The people who are the most upset about this story, the most upset that a, a doctor, a high-profile person who is encouraging people to stay at home, to not mingle with people from other households, to, to not do all the things that she chose to do, they'd actually be the most forgiving to the behavior. The people that are the most upset about this story, in my opinion, are the people who are most likely to forgive someone who broke those rules and what and became, you know, willing to be around family members that chose to travel, that chose to interact with people that didn't live with them. And even if they gave excuses like 10 months here, they've been no one's done anything. They haven't hit a shopping mall. They're all you know, food. They had food stocked up for 10 months. No one's gone outdoors of any kind. And I have every doubt that that's not true. Uh, but those individuals, if she had just been honest from the forefront, be, it's the double standard that's the problem. And, and I don't want to vilify Dr. Burks because there's a bunch of people listening to the show right now that also broke those rules, air quote, quote unquote, or uh, depending on where you live, they might have been actual rules. There are a lot of people who chose and that will choose for Christmas to say, and this is the quote actually from one of the, the stories that I found, mom's worth it. Mom is more important. Dad is more important. Family members that have medical issues that, you know, obviously a lot of people would be scared about in general interacting with those individuals on the off chance that you could somehow give them coronavirus. Um, all of those things are factual. And yet, uh, and I, I talked about my grandmother when I was in around Thanksgiving. I had an interesting birthday phone call uh, on Halloween. It's my birthday. And my grandmother calls me and she immediately spins into coronavirus which, by the way, after this conversation, I think I have to get to happier, more positive things. Uh, but she starts talking about how she's not afraid of it. And if it's her time to go, she's very Catholic, very religious. She believes that when it's the right time, that God will choose to take her and bring her to heaven and that she's fine with it. And she'd much rather see family members at her advanced age than, than not. She would much rather continue to live life. And like Dr. Deborah Burke said about her, her family, uh, she might need that interaction. That might be something that's valuable to her. So as we continue to have these conversations and vilify everyone involved or talk about how this person's a political operative or not, the only way that it ever seems kind of true is when you do something completely different than what you told everyone else to do. When you are as much of a hypocrite as possible, you become more like a politician than a doctor. That's just my opinion. And yet I don't totally believe it. All right, let's shift gears. Some of the sillier things, some of the crazier things going on. You know, there was another pardon yesterday, by the way. It wasn't a presidential pardon. This was a pardon that took place. The governor in Colorado did it. And I can't believe we're not talking about this more. Uh, the bubble boy hoax, if you remember from 2009, the bubble boy thing that took everybody's attention all over the place, the parents were pardoned. The parents involved in that scam, that hoax, where there wasn't actually a kid floating away in a bubble. Uh, that was an inaccurate statement. He was found totally safe elsewhere. 
Uh, but that they got pardoned too. And I know we're upset about Stone. I know we're upset about Manafort. But these sleazy criminals, these these parents, they just lied. They they took us all on this, uh, admittedly somewhat wonderful distraction for a bit, uh, being very afraid that there was a kid in a bubble, and uh, that wound up not being the case. And they are finally out ten years. Uh, so it's obviously a little different than some of the other things happening. Uh, but the governor there said that they've they've served their time, that they've done everything that they should do uh, in accordance to what the crime that they committed. And so I, I am surprised we're not hitting that harder. We're not hitting the fact that the bubble boy people are out. All right, let's totally shift gears. Let's get away from all that. It is the holiday season. Obviously, it's an odd kind of holiday season. A lot of people will be traveling. A lot of people will be wearing masks and doing all kinds of things. Uh, so this invention might be the perfect gift if you still have time to get it. And I doubt you do. I don't know if they do next day air from Japan. Uh, but there is a company, Yaman is the name of the company, which, by the way, is just awesome to me. Uh, they have a medical lift silicone mask that they are selling, which will sculpt your face while protecting you from coronavirus. It sends electrical signals to the muscles inside your neck, your chin, all those areas that every one of us would like to just shape a little bit more. And I, I promise this isn't uh, all of a sudden a commercial for them. But it will it will tense those facial muscles to create firmness, decrease the appearance of aging. It can go all the way up to your eyelids. You actually can get some eyelid treatment as well. It will be similar to a facelift, according to the company, because of the amount of time you have to wear a mask. And this is completely non-invasive. This, you know, no need for surgery. The mask looks ridiculous. I will be entirely honest with you. And the first photo of it actually has a hole where your mouth and your nose would be. So obviously they're going to create a different version of this product to actually protect you from from putting spittle out there in the world. Uh, Because this version of the mask would be the exact opposite of what you need in the time of the pandemic. Uh, But they said that they'll be celebrate they'll be selling the MedLift mask with a full covering so that you can be you know uh, (laughs) safe this holiday season and also come out of the process looking so much better. I mean, if they told us that back when we first started quarantining, if you could make the chair version of this, like every version of this, and I'm sure they're out there, but if we just had those products hit the market like crazy right now. Are you stuck at home? Are you incapable of going anywhere without wearing a mask? Better your body while doing nothing because all the uh, all the appliances, all the contraptions you have on you will now work those muscles via these electrical currents. Uh, which, by the way, if you ever got ripped that way, like let's say you had a buddy and he wore all of this equipment, not just on his face, but all over his body. And six months from now, he was he was he looked like the rock. I don't think we would respect that as much. I don't think you'd give him the full credit of putting on the workout bodysuit and then sitting there and binge-watching a Netflix series, and then coming out the other side. But to be honest, with the way that all things have gone in 2020, at the same time, I would give him his attaboy. I'd be like, you know, I'm not exactly proud of the work you did. I don't think anyone's going to tell you that you put in a lot of hard work here. You sat and ate Funyuns and had a nice time. But it's 2020, and you got healthier, so, so good on you. Although I would need a doctor to tell me if that actually would be healthier if you did no physical exercise. And electrical currents made you healthier if you are indeed uh, better off for that. But maybe I wouldn't ask Dr. Deborah Burks because I don't know if her answer will be on the up and up. I'm sorry, Dr. Burks. Had to go there. All right, I got to take a break. This is Craig Collins filling in on The Chad Benson Show. don't get into politics. As an ordinary suburban housewife, I feel a little disrespected. I teach my children not to name cards. You are a flabberman! A flabberman! Come on, man! Um, guys, can we please keep the chatter to a minimum? Chad Benson. Just a loud mouth. This is the Chad Benson Show. My name is Craig Collins filling in. I want to share a story with you, a feel-good story in a way, a story about survival. I want you to understand that this is lighthearted in nature. I am not comparing it to any of the serious, actually out there stories of survival of, of people overcoming things like coronavirus. Those are way more important than this. But yet this story just entertains the crap out of me. Uh, the guy's name is Neil Kramer. He is a freelance pho- photographer and journalist. He's living in New York. He's in Queens. And uh, he went viral recently because of his experience the last 10 months. He, very early on in the year, opened his home to two people that he knows very well. One of those two is his mom, uh, so that they could stay with him for a little bit because they were having issues. His mother actually was 
trying to move to Florida, but she was, she was having some some housing things come up. So mom moves in. This is before coronavirus and, and the pandemic really start, before quarantine, before any of that stuff. This is early this year. And then the other human being that asked to live with him for just a little bit, uh, Neil Kramer, is his ex-wife. Not, not current wife. His ex-wife, her name is Sophia Lansky. She lives in California. They were having a plumbing issue in that home, in that apartment that's there. So this guy in early 2020, thinks for just a couple weeks he can navigate the situation that his ex-wife and mom in a two-bedroom apartment in Queens, New York. Two bedrooms. I don't know what room he's staying in, but you know each of those two women got a room that's designated to them, not him. It's her room for mom. It's her room for the ex. And he stays in one of them. I I guess depending on how much he's fighting with the ex at the time, I can guess which one it is. Uh, But it's just surreal. And he wound up taking photographs of his 10-month experience, and this is what's gone viral with those two individuals, because he said a lot of issues popped up. In early March, he said tensions are already rising, and so one way to diffuse those tension is to just put out silly photos. Uh, One of the other problems, I guess, for for Neil is he's a bather. He takes baths, which, by the way, I judge no man that does a bath every so often. I judge no human that does a bath every so often because I think they're lovely. I've known a lot of guys, uh, a lot of dudes, uh, that seem to think that this is not necessarily the most appropriate uh, behavior for for a guy, and I say you got to wake up. Twenty twenty hashtag woke hashtag gender roles are wrong. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding in a way about something. But you know, if you got to bathe, you got to bathe. But I guess both of the individuals were coming in on him while he was in that situation. And I will tell you this too: that there are two people you'll know throughout your life that won't care about what you're doing in the bathroom when they need in, and those people are mom and the person you marry. Those are the two individuals that don't see that as a boundary anymore. Uh, once I guess enough things have happened, one of the two. I guess giving birth to you has probably made them in the clear as far as caring what's going on. The other individual is the wife. Eventually, she just doesn't care. So he puts photo after photo up, and people have gone uh, viral reacting to them. But, man, the situation he's in, outside of just the experience that we're all getting on social media, like every other social media experience, by the way, you get the the happy version or the very uh, simplistic photograph version of someone's life. This guy has survived 10 months, 10 months in a two bedroom in Queens with mom and with an ex-wife. He's not getting married again, by the way. I would have assumed that maybe that was part of the the happy version of this story that maybe they reconciled and they're going to get back together. No, they continue to live together. All three of these people for now. I think you just stay. I think at this point you find a house, maybe get a third bedroom so Neil can finally have his own and you just find a way to keep going because if it's worked out for this long and I know there's probably a lot of reasons not to do it. But you got it. This is the the threes company version that we needed of a show. It's this guy, his ex wife, and his mom. I mean, this is a sitcom next year, probably, and we have Neil to thank for it. In other silly news, because it is a holiday, and I like talking about sillier things more than serious ones. There's these console wars. Uh, PlayStation Five and Xbox have new new you know video game systems out, and people are like robbing trucks. They're actually doing the Fast and the Furious version of ripping off a truck to get some of these PS5s. They're very hard to get a hand on. And so KFC is trying, yes, Kentucky Fried Chicken is trying to jump into this situation. They have a gaming console, or so they call it, which is also just a PC gaming uh, piece of uh, computer equipment. It's not necessarily a PlayStation or Xbox specific. And the, the reason that it's branded to Kentucky Fried Chicken is that you have the video game element in this uh, product. And then you also have the ability to warm fried chicken in the top of it. Cause it's a bucket. It's not, it's not a typical square console. It is a bucket console that has a, a chicken warming element to it. And come on, this sounds incredible. After I read about this, I was like, you know, I'm not much of a gamer uh, anymore. The wife uh, ruined that, uh, took that away from me. Uh, but I am Probably someone who enjoys a KFC uh, fried chicken every so often. Although this would also be the laziest thing you could walk in on someone doing. If in 2020, if in coronavirus and the pandemic, you've judged anyone you've known for embracing that at-home lifestyle, you know it would be even worse if you saw them buy the KFC console, uh, the KF console, I guess you could say too, and then just warm chicken while playing video games for hours on end. And it doesn't even cook the chicken, by the way. You'd have to have it delivered to the house or I guess get off your your butt and go get it, and then you put it in the console you're playing video games on to keep it warm so you can eat it throughout the day because you're not going to get to all that chicken at once. You're going to have to do this piece by piece. And just the the controller, by the way, for the video game console there, that would be the greasiest thing alive. 
Uh, they say that there's some really, really um, uh, very uh, 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 greasy and, and very uh, bad virus, uh, whatever, uh, just uh, germ-ridden places within the home or within the airport or anywhere. But the, the KFC controller uh, for the KFC game console has to take that cake. All right, one last thing, and this is odd. Admittedly, uh, this is probably not going to hit with everybody, and I don't even know if I have a whole lot of time to get to it right now. But there are seals in the deep, deep parts of the ocean that are making a very odd sci-fi Star Wars noises, and no one knows why. This is what that sounds like. That is an animal. That is not a game. That is not a computer. Those are animals in the deep parts of the ocean. Scientists just discovered this. They're very confused about it, and yet no one's scared because what we don't need right now in 2020 is another thing to be fearful of. So, you know, whales making laser sounds in the ocean, or, or seals, excuse me. Let's just forget about this entirely and enjoy the fact that it's odd and not think any deeper. If I were afraid of aliens, now would be the time. Greg Collins filling in on the Chad Benson Show. Good luck to us all. This is the Chad Benson Show. Independent thoughts, independent life. This is Chad Benson. This is the Chad Benson Show. My name is Craig Collins filling in. I am not Chad. Direct your anger on the social media to me, the Craig Collins Show on Facebook.com. I think I have a Twitter. That's got very few followers. So go there and talk to me too. I won't see it for days. Uh, Rick Santorum was arguing on uh, TV earlier today, uh, and I thought that was tremendously interesting. It was with uh, uh, John Hardwood. Hardwood. And uh, here, just hear some of the back and forth, because uh, I think if my point today is going to be that in order for us to really get to the heart of the argument as to whether or not the pardons from the president were appropriate, a misuse of power, the most egregious of any any president ever in the history of our time, if any of that is potentially accurate, the way in which you need to make this argument is rationally the way in which you need to make this this argument to the people who agree and more importantly, the people who disagree with you is without emotional uh, attack uh, kinds of, uh, you know, rhetoric and just with simple facts, things like this is what uh, Manafort did. This is how he evaded his taxes and this is wrong and you shouldn't be out of prison that quickly for that. Or this is how Roger Stone lied to the FBI and these are the things that they did that are important and not necessarily that the president is a giant sleazebag, as we heard in some of the other things. But here, here is a back and forth from television that I found tremendously interesting. First off, I completely reject everything that John Harwood just said. I don't think anything uh, that that this uh, the, the whole Russian collusion conspiracy, frankly, uh, you know, has fell flat and the American public saw it for that. And, and the reality is that what Donald Trump is Are doing right kidding? now is affirming, <laughs> is affirming one thing. And that is that he believes he's not going to be president on J- and January 20th, because if he did believe he was going to be president on January 20th, he wouldn't be doing these things. So that's that's, by the way, a great take uh, from Rick as far as discussing the actual impact of what's going on right now. The president is signaling to a lot of people because every president does this at the end of their second term or at the end of their, their presidency, if they're not going to run again or if I guess in the off chance, as with Trump, uh, you may have lost uh, for your bid for reelection. You do this. You you pardon a bunch of people at the tail end. Clinton did this. Obama did that. Everybody's done it. It's a thing that you do. Uh, to the degree that you do it, I know that we're going to have a lot of debate. Does everyone go as 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 extreme as the current president has gone? Depending on who you ask, that answer is yes or no. Uh, but I think it's just great because uh, John Harwood is talking all about Russia and collusion and all those things and referencing how the president is probably still guilty of crimes that no one was able to prove uh, he was guilty of and that the silence of people like Manafort and Stone are a huge reason why the president never got caught. And Rick Santorum is trying to shift gears and be like, that's not part of this conversation. And John's not totally having that. I, 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 I think it is it 
everything Ask that Bill Barr uh, Senator he believes Santorum everything just said, said, because the attorney general doesn't believe what you just said. Logic. <laughs> no, it doesn't defy it. it, it the, what defies it? We spent four years talking about mm -hmm. something that 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 is unproven and that. It yeah, I got to be honest. Uh, the back and forth there too. If you didn't hear it, uh, Santorum is trying to say that whatever John's about to say is crap, and John's trying to say that everything Rick Santorum just said defies logic. Try to have that argument with those words with a loved one. Do that for me. Do me that favor. The next time you get in a fight with the misses over anything. Try to say that the words she just said defy logic and see how that goes for you. See if that winds up winning you the argument. I'm sorry, honey. Uh, I'm not going to do the dishes as you just asked because the words you said defy logic. I, I, I have a Mexican wife. I get hit by shoes when I do bad things. They throw shoes. That's something that she says is in her culture. She's amazing at it. She's like Captain America with a shoe. The way that he would hurl his shield. She can do that with precision. And if I ever tell her that the words she said defy logic... So many shoes. We will be out of shoes within a day. Uh, here's one more, the back and forth, or at least Santorum trying to, to finalize his point after arguing with John. Paul Manafort was convicted. Roger Stone. Absolutely. What, it had nothing was to do convicted. with, by the way, the election. It had to do with his dealings uh, prior but to they, the But they election, were convicted. So, so on, on those Trump. pardons, do you feel good about those pardons tonight? To suggest that those pardons somehow grease the skids. They've already been through the trial, right. John. They've already been convicted. You can't leverage them anymore. This this part had nothing to do with unshackling people who are leveraged. That's just not the reality. And so obviously he's now going back and forth with the host too on MSNBC or CNN or whatever the heck. The, the, the I don't even care anymore, to be honest with you all the time. Um, but there there is some concession too with that last point that the things that they were prosecuted for, the things they were in trouble uh, and wound up going to jail over, wound up getting convicted over, did not connect to the president and to Russia the way that the entire investigation wanted it to. And that is the point. That is the rational version of this conversation, depending on what side of the aisle you're on. Should these guys who were caught doing bad things, you know, actually bad things, go to jail because the reason they were investigated in the first place was what a lot of people on the right will say was a complete hoax, a Russian conspiracy that didn't exist. Even William Barr, who now does not have... Uh, the president as a friend on Facebook. I'm sure they unfriended each other. Uh, Attorney Barr um, said that he didn't see any value in that entire investigation, that it was politically motivated and that that was inappropriate. And then obviously later on said some other things uh, about the election that made the president not so happy. But th this has been true a lot more often than people want to admit it's true that the Russia investigation didn't bring about the proof that so many people thought existed. And so when you talk about people who get pardoned, I'm sure in the president's opinion, they're getting pardoned, one, because there's friends. Yes, there are other people that were involved that didn't get pardoned. But two, because he thinks the entire investigation was inappropriate. And that that's his take. And I guess he can make that uh, argument for us. And I know that that's not going to win everybody over. And I do want to be fair in saying, I'm not even sure I personally agree with the pardons. I'm not sure I'd go down the road of pardoning those guys for tax evasion and the other things they did. But this is not the shocking, no one's ever done this in any, any way before story that we're pretending it is. Look up what Bill Clinton did the last day he was in office and the people he pardoned, uh, some of them family members, some of them connected to things like cocaine trafficking, uh, and obviously all of them got to get out and, and you know no longer be uh, people that are incarcerated. And, and even in this case, uh, Roger Stone, by the way, who did appear on Tucker Carlson, and I can maybe play that audio later, he's already out of jail. The guy was already out. He was already uh, dancing around being being a person that was no longer in in a cell somewhere. And so, you know, that plays into it too. Oh, by the way, I do want to say this somewhat in earnest and then a little bit, I guess, uh, jokingly. I guess it's it's Dr. Fauci Day. I think that's today. I don't think that's tomorrow. I want to wish you happy holidays. If you are a resident of the Washington, D.C. area, I want to wish you happy Anthony Fauci Day tomorrow. It is Anthony Fauci's 80th birthday, and the district has declared it Fauci Day tomorrow in his honor, which seems uh, just right. Rachel Maddow, very happy about Dr. Fauci Day. Dr. Fauci, not so happy, by the way, about some other things going on. He won't be able to see his daughters. Unlike Dr. Burks, he is going to go ahead and stay away from family uh, this holiday season. He was on TV recently talking about that. I definitely feel sad. I have three daughters ranging in age from late 20s to early 30s. This is the first holiday season of Christmas and my birthday that I have not spent with my daughters since they were born. Yes, and that's very sad. And a lot of people who are listening to the advice of, of you, Dr. Fauci, and any other medical professional, Dr. Burks, who may or may not listen, anyone else that is listening to that advice is going to also deal with that same emotional 
and and mental challenge this holiday season. Uh, but it is it is weird to see the celebration of Fauci in the media. Not because again, I want to I want to reiterate, I don't believe that doctors are political operatives. I, I just don't see that for the most part in this world. And guys who've served or, or or you know professionals who've served for as long as both of those two uh, very well known, very prominent doctors have. I don't see them necessarily being an operative for a political party, but doctors can be more afraid and less afraid of things all the time. You can go to one doctor. I have like this little bump on my skin right now. I got this. Uh, it's on my chest area. No one uh, assume it's something worse. I got this little thing. It's like uh, up here. And I brought it to a doctor recently. He looked at it. He's like, you're fine. That's nothing. That's no big deal. And I was like, you sure it's not something serious? And I don't know. Another doctor might have looked at it and thought differently. Uh, but my doctor doesn't seem to care about most things. It's just the way they are. They're human beings. They're people with medical training and some uh, very high-profile positions that give their medical opinion. And whether or not it's actually uh, achievable, whether or not it's something that we even agree with, and whether or not a, a second opinion from somebody else like President Trump has gotten from other medical professionals winds up being different. You know, we're, we're treating these individuals like they actually make the policy. President Trump is supposed to listen to all of his experts and then make his decision as the president of the United States. Dr. Fauci was never elected president. And so the, the politicizing of that individual and the, the different feelings about him and even the love for him is just so odd because you, you feel it. You know, you feel it the way anything else goes. Like when you hear someone say something positive about someone else, but you know what they're actually trying to do is insult you. <laughs> and that might have been hard to understand, but it happens, you know, like the next time. Uh, my wife and I are, are sitting in the living room watching a TV show during quarantine, during pandemic, and being very happy about that. And that one dumb neighbor who's been working out every day of quarantine jogs by our house, you know, with his stupid shirt off in the middle of December, buddy. You got to throw the shirt back on. And my wife looks out the window at the exact moment, sees the guy, and goes, man, you know, uh, um, John has really kept in shape pretty well during quarantine. You know that's a shot at me, honey. You know you're not actually, although maybe a little bit, looking at that guy too much. But you know the truth is you're trying to say to the guy with chips on his stomach as he's watching through the last episodes of Cobra Kai that he needs to get up and do a little bit of working out, a little bit of exercising himself. And that's what it is. That's what this whole anger slash thing is, is the media celebrating the ways that Fauci stood up to the president. And even Dr. Fauci begging people to stop talking about that, but it continuing to happen is what caused all this division. And I've said it before, and I'll say it again. I believe that every single thing that the media kind of interprets with its media lens winds up making it much more extreme than regular human beings. We just need someone to go on a, a radio station, a TV show, and I'm not trying to say backhandedly that this is me. It might be Chad, though. Chad's better at this than I am. And just tell the truth. Just tell the truth without any spin, without any ver Like, this is my version of an opinion, and I'm not trying to make it more extreme than what it actually is. And maybe at the end of the day, we'll all come a little bit closer as people. That's my holiday wish on this Christmas Eve. I'll take a break. we got a lot more coming up, a lot of silly topics to get to. Craig Collins filling in for Chad Benson. No fake outrage here. Just the real thing. The Chad Benson Show. This is the Chad Benson Show. My name is Craig Collins filling in. Happy to be here with you always. Happy holidays. Happy almost Christmas. Happy uh, Merry Christmas Eve, I guess I should say. Uh, the internet needs to be stopped. This is something I say every so often, and I do have a couple examples of it, uh, because these sort of things I don't think were successful prior to the internet. I know there's a lot of people trying to get you know Facebook dismantled or whatever dismantled. I know that they're all having very serious takes on the, the problems with the maybe uh, monopolies that exist in our world uh, as far as technology goes, that's not my issue. My issue is that these two companies exist and are successful. Well, one's a company, one's a social media post. Uh, the first is a company that is selling air from their country uh, for anyone that's homesick that's not currently there. This is in the UK. Uh, this company is selling bottled air. Mr. Baggy is the name of the company, and they've been selling the fresh British air at 25 euro a pop uh, for quite some time, and they're selling out. They're out of stock in a lot of the different varieties. This is stupidity, uh, just fully displayed. It's thirty three bucks, by the way. That's the uh, the transition from the euro to the dollar. Uh, you can't. I I can't. I don't even want to explain all the reasons why. If you bought a bottle of air, you made a mistake with some of your money. 
Uh, but this exists, and people are purchasing it because they're like, oh, I don't even know. Like, do you actually crack it open? And there are flavors, by the way. They have fish and chips edition. They have the underground edition for the subway, uh, which is something that, depending on where you're from, I don't think you'd necessarily want to smell. Uh, they have a, a lot of locations that are available that might be scenic and or not. Uh, some of it's 100% pure air. But if you did get this for a holiday and, like, you're happy about it, what do you, do you open it? Because if, if by any chance... There's any amount of actual air trapped in there that was successfully, you know, encased in there and then stayed in there uh, until you crack that bottle back open. Doesn't it all leave immediately? 33 bucks to to sniff a bottle that probably doesn't smell like what you want it to smell like and probably got sprayed with something, too, by the way. I'm sure that if the company is being smart about it, they made some sort of air freshener addition in which they actually put chemicals in there. So you think that it worked. But that is a thing that exists. And here's the other one. Here's the other one that proves to me that the internet needs to be stopped at all costs at any point. We need to all get off of it collectively. This holiday season, what you and I need to do is refuse Facebook, refuse all of it. A 25-year-old is viral on social media, specifically on Instagram, but it's not a human. It's a puddle. It's a 25-year-old puddle that's out of a Far East city in Russia. It has 16,000 followers who comment on it all the time, and some jamoke who created this profile, who puts up updates about it. It's it's a puddle in the street. And social media, at least at 16,000, is not the millions that flood to other places. But it's a puddle. You know, like this shouldn't have any followers. No one should ever, and I, I can't even imagine if they reach out, like if it's all local community people, which I imagine it is, like the local businesses there. They're like, hey, man, I got 16,000 followers on my puddle account. You want to advertise your product? What do you do? You put it in the puddle? And you take a photo of that, and you're like, uh, Puddle Guy is now telling you that you should go get some air from the from the UK this holiday season, the perfect gift. It makes no sense. And that is also, by the way, what Instagram becomes. And I think SNL did a parody, parody on this. I think a lot of other places do it. And I know a lot of people don't think SNL is funny. Uh, but if you get success on, on a social media platform, if you wind up having millions of followers because you're an attractive person who posts photos of you being attractive and or whatever it is, uh, there's a baby that cooks that I, I actually do follow. Uh, Chef Kobe is somebody I like a lot. Eventually, you monetize it. Uh, Chef Kobe's been monetized now. He's he's hawking products, and he's he's an infant. He doesn't even know what he's selling, but it's out there. Uh, and then, actually, as I say all that, as I criticize the Internet and all the ridiculous, maybe disappointing things, like a social media account for a puddle that has over 10,000, over two social media followers, there are other ways in which this connection is wonderful. Uh, without the ability to access the Internet, I wouldn't know about this story out of Cleveland, which which made me laugh hard. And I don't know, maybe my my humor is much more generous in a time of coronavirus and tied to pandemic and everything. But I, I saw this report. An 18-year-old woman had called the police a little after uh, noon. So this is like 1230 in the afternoon. This is a couple days ago. Uh, she calls the police because she's very upset at her brother, and she needs them to, to investigate immediately. And they actually show up, by the way which anytime we ever criticize law enforcement, they do the job above and beyond all the time. She claimed that her brother had farted on her toothbrush and she was upset about it. That's right. He farted on the toothbrush. According to her claim, they found out it was all a lie that she doesn't even live in that city. She lives somewhere completely different and just wanted to annoy her brother by getting the police to show up to investigate the toothbrush farting. And that is also, in my opinion, the most harmless, but also disrespectful thing you could ever do. If you were in a fight with a human and you didn't like, tamper the toothbrush by putting something actually on it that could contaminate it, but you just farted in the general direction of a person's toothbrush, like that is, that's full-on criminal. That is psycho to the to the 10th degree. That person should be locked up and not pardoned by the president in any scenario. But just the fact that she goes through this and that he has to deal with it, like, officer, my, my no, my, my sister doesn't even live here. I did not fart on her toothbrush. Maybe years ago as a kid, I, I did and she's still getting me for it years later. But that's all this is, officer. Leave us alone. That's what the internet is good for. It's Chad Benson Show. I'm Craig Collins. Talk to you in a bit. The Chad Benson Show.
independent thoughts, independent life. This is Chad Benson. This is the Chad Benson Show. Merry Christmas Eve. My name is Craig Collins filling in for the day. I'll be around a lot this holiday season. Chad will be back in the new year. A uh, very uh, deserved vacation for Chad. Um, this is an uplifting headline, and I'm being as sarcastic as I can possibly be. I'm sarcastic very often if you listen to me while I'm on this show or anywhere else uh, that I am, but this is probably the most. I saw an article about how people celebrated Christmas in 1918. Uh, that was when we were dealing with the Spanish uh, flu, the, the whole big outbreak that is most compared to the coronavirus, and it's a deep dive uh, using things like Smithsonian Magazine and other different uh, articles and, and things that uh, politicians said. And I, I saw the headline. I'm like, that's going to depress me. I won't talk about it. I won't read it. None of that's going to happen. And all the opposite's happening because I got, I got pulled in. It's one of those rabbit holes you go down. It's eerily similar, uh, the stuff that happened around this time back then uh, to now. There was a politician out of Ohio that's in the Ohio State Journal that said you will show your love to dad, mother, brother, sister, and the rest of them this year by sticking to your own home instead of paying uh, annual Christmas visits, holding family reunions and parties uh, generally. It goes against everything we love to do and not to not celebrate the holiday season, and we must nevertheless not do it. It makes me sad to say it. That's one of the politicians in 1918 telling people to stay home. Uh, I think actually one of the medical professionals that's quoted in one of the magazines, uh, the Nebraska State Board of Health, categorized the Spanish influenza as a quarantinable disease, asked people to stay inside. Uh, there's example after example of this everywhere, even in places uh, like California, who had some of the worst outbreaks back in 1918, I guess. Uh, but if you're doing your history right, you realize that there were some things going on. There were people coming back from World War I, and there were some really valuable reasons for Americans to celebrate some of the better things happening in their life. They flooded the streets anyway. There, there's report after report of people ignoring these guidelines of flooding the streets of being out in the world when they weren't supposed to be masks weren't a thing you didn't have the cdc at all to recommend anything back then you didn't have uh, any of the treatments that we had now to really make it as as possible to survive even a, another illness coming with the spanish flu people didn't listen our society obviously survived you know a lot of bad things happened there was a lot of of loss of life but at the end of the day we've we've done all this before to the exact degree we're doing it now, and it's just sort of eerie. So I guess my my holiday recommendation for you, if you want, you know, some light reading, some uplifting reading while you're enjoying the holiday season, just dive into what happened back in 1918 around the Christmas time. Uh, by the way, 1918, I think that was the last time the Red Sox won the World Series uh, before the recent ones that have happened, um, and that says something to a lot of us. <laughs> I'm a Yankee fan, so I wanted to take that side shot there. Uh, 1918, I think that was it. 1908 was the Cubs' right. And it was 1918 for the Red Sox up until uh, 2004, which I just don't acknowledge as a Yankee fan ever happened. All right, let's move on. Uh, shift gears to other things, sillier things. Things I like. Oh, well, although we could actually talk about football real quick, since I just touched on on uh, baseball. Why not? Let's talk about uh, well, and also basketball. The NBA had one of its games canceled because of a a COVID scare, COVID outbreak, uh, and actually they only had eight players capable of suiting up for one of the teams that was supposed to play a basketball game. And this will be very interesting to see this year. Uh, to see how everything goes in the world of, of basketball specifically since they're not going to be in a bubble. Uh, last year they were obviously in a bubble. The NFL has navigated that as best as you can and had a season. They had a successful season. College football has existed. We have playoff teams. We have hot takes on whether or not Notre Dame deserves to be in uh, the four-team playoff even after they already beat the team. I, you know, I won't, I won't dovetail there. You might be able to tell I'm a Notre Dame fan too. I like a lot of teams that people hate. Uh, the Yankees and Notre Dame, but I am from the East Coast. I was born and raised in New Jersey, so my Yankee fandom, I had no idea uh, what a salary cap was. But a lot of these other organizations were capable of of navigating the pandemic. Granted, at a time when it was more in recession than now, obviously in the summer it was a little bit easier than it is in the fall. And so the, it's going to be tremendously interesting to see the NBA and how they navigate what are potential outbreaks, potential changes uh, as they occur compared to a year when all the players got pretty used to playing all their games and not worrying at all about the pandemic because they were in a bubble. And I don't know if you bubble again. And I know that LeBron James, I think, claimed that he is the best player in NBA history for two reasons. One of those reasons is because he, he had the best comeback in NBA history, coming back against the Warriors team that had won more games than even the Bulls team back in the 90s, uh, the most wins ever by a team. And LeBron's uh, Cavaliers beat that team after being down three games to one. And then also LeBron said his championship this past season in which he navigated the pandemic to become 
an NBA champion. Now, granted, he didn't do, I think, the same level of work he did back with Cleveland. I think he had uh, significant help this time around. Uh, but he said those are the reasons why he's the best player of all time. He's navigated the most difficult uh, things that, that a player was ever asked to do, one of them being a bubble. Uh, but yet this year, they, they haven't bubbled yet. They, they might, though. And I don't know if, if LeBron wins again, if that adds to his argument that he's the greatest of all time when the answer is actually Michael Jordan. Uh, but it will be interesting to see how this all goes, how, how that organization navigates all this, because they're going to continue to, to exist. Obviously, college football is about to end. Uh, a lot of other things are about to end in the world of, of NFL football. That only takes a couple more months. Uh, and maybe by that point, there's enough vaccines out there. By the way, I even read uh, recently, and this is supposed to be feel-good news, and it's not being that, uh, that we're taking longer with the vaccine than we want to. Operation Warp Speed is saying we're not getting it administered as much as had hoped. We'd hope for something like 20 million people uh, by the end of the year, and we might be closer to 10 uh, than 20 million. But it's still out there. It's still a thing. It's still happening. The NBA is a, a, a if you love it, if you don't love it, I understand that too. Uh, but it's an organization that's playing basketball games. The NFL, all that. All these things have happened. All these these organizations have been capable of putting on their seasons and and distracting the American people from anything else. And then there's also this story, actually. I really like this story because this guy, I feel like if anybody deserves a pardon, and you might totally disagree, and that's fine, but no one was hurt as far as I understand. Uh, that Delta Airlines guy, the, the guy who jumped off the, the flight, he's a Delta passenger. He said he had a panic attack, some sort of anxiety attack while sitting on a plane, which, by the way, in 2020, not that I think I would personally have one, but I can't totally fault the guy for having it. He, he wound up getting the emergency exit all set up and sliding down it. Uh, he, he, he is in trouble. This is criminal mischief, reckless endangerment. Uh, he is going to be in a lot of trouble. And, and yet, since no one was actually injured, and since they do say that he also might be suffering from a mental illness of some kind, I think that if we're, we're going to pardon Roger Stone, Paul Manafort, we pardon this guy. We let him off the hook as quickly as possible. Uh, by the way, he is from Florida. I don't know if that's surprising to everybody. And I apologize to those who listen to the show in Florida. But when it said where, where he's from, I was like, okay. I mean, that I, I can connect some more dots there. Uh, but he's going to be in a criminal court in New York because that's, you're not really allowed uh, to do those sort of things. You can't really just uh, jump off a plane uh, right before takeoff by uh, getting all the emergency exits to, you know, to operate. When I, I wonder if you can see the look in somebody's eye. Like, if you're the flight attendant, you're supposed to ask for the people in those seats, like, can you handle this responsibility? I wonder if, especially this year, you notice somebody who seems like they can't handle the responsibility or might do it wrong and actually open it on their own. And maybe you go, all right, let's move this guy. Let's get this person out of the seat right now so they're not tempted to just bail on this flight because I, I can see it happening. They're messing with the, the handle a little bit too much. I see where this is going. Let's prevent this from happening. One other story in the news that distracted me a lot, too. It's just a headline to this. And I, honestly, like this is kind of an earmuff situation. If you ever seen the movie Old School? Uh, there was a character in that movie that Vince Vaughn plays that says if you're going to talk about a topic that's a tad more adult, you tell the kids to put earmuffs over their ears for just a second. And this is that situation, although I will be as delicate as I can. Uh, there was an on-duty police officer. He's actually a Los Angeles County Sheriff's deputy that got in a lot of trouble. He's, I think he's suspended right now while there's an investigation going on. He didn't get in trouble for any of that stuff we see in the news all the time, though. This is a very unique thing. He left his microphone on, and it, it says accidentally, although I know that the, the cameras, the microphones, all that stuff, they're supposed to be on all the time now. And he, he met a, a young lady. He met a, a woman. I, I think that this was not an arrest of any kind. It wasn't like he was operating in the capacity of police officer, at least that we know. Uh, but he left his mic on, I think just his microphone, and a dispatcher heard a, a back-and-forth interaction that she was pretty sure she didn't want to hear. This is a real story in the news. I think TMZ even obtained the audio, which I am not going to play. Uh, it's about a minute long, which I'm not trying to judge anybody, but okay. Uh, a minute long audio of a woman making noises and, and interacting with the police officer <laughs> and the dispatcher pleading. The one part that I kind of wanted to play of this audio, not that I listened for research purposes only, uh, but the one part was the, the dispatcher begging to turn the mic off. Like, yeah, you, you got an open mic, open microphone. This The microphone's open. Can you close it? Because, like, they really didn't want to hear that. How would that affect your day, too, by the way? You're a police dispatch person. You're sitting in your desk. You got the headphones on. You know, you're doing your thing, kind of telling everybody what to do. And then all of a sudden, in one of the ears, you're like, uh-oh, what's happening here? Somebody's computer's on. What's going on? Nope, this is a dispatcher, or this is a police officer. Please turn that off, please. 
And this guy, no matter what was going on, no matter what the, the police officer was doing, whether it was uh, illicit in nature or fully legal and just on the, on the clock of the business he was on, I don't know any of the details on the story other than what was observed or heard over the, over the radio. Uh, I know that he's probably as upset or as disappointed as anyone else in this situation. Uh, you know, because th- this really is a very boneheaded mistake that so many people are making in a year when technology is at the forefront of our lives differently than ever. And it's just, you just got to mute the mic, man. If there were a t-shirt for the tips we need to give people in the year that is 2020, because politicians have been fa- uh, fallen uh, all over the, the world because they've left on a camera during a, a work meeting and then some stuff happened that wasn't supposed to happen. You, story after story of this, it's turn off the camera Turn off the microphone. This is 2020. And we're only weeks a week away or so of it being totally over, which is great. But I, I don't know. I don't know if I feel bad for this guy or not. I'm sure more details will have to come out. I definitely feel bad for the dispatcher, though. But what do you do? That's a job where I think you got to stay tapped in. You can't take the, the headphones off and walk away. If someone else contacts you for another reason, I think you got to sit there. So you just deal with it. A minute long. Again, not judging anybody. All right, this is the Chad Benson Show. Craig Collins filling in. You go, boy. This isn't about right or left. This is just about right and wrong. Right you are, Chad. The Chad Benson Show. This is the Chad Benson Show. My name is Craig Collins filling in. Hey, look at this. The Brexit deal that's been reached. The Prime Minister Boris Johnson says there's been a deal reached and some trade and other things in here. Let's hear from them. And so I say again uh, directly to our EU friends and partners, I think this deal means a new stability and a new uh, certainty in what has sometimes been a fractious and difficult relationship. We will be your friend, your ally, your supporter, and indeed, never let it be forgotten, your number one market. You know what's nice about this, in my opinion, is that uh, on Christmas Eve, people can come to an agreement, people can figure out some way to get some stuff done. And I think that we need this again. Maybe Boris Johnson, just because he's got that that UK accent that's obviously so different for us here. Uh, maybe he needs to be the one that does the press announcement about uh, President Trump and, uh, I don't know, uh, members of the Senate, members of the House, members of everybody, uh, getting together on the stimulus deal, getting it done, figuring out a way. Uh, by the way, the uh, Democrats in the House did try to pass the $2,000 uh, ad, uh, the kick up of money from 600 apiece for everybody to 2000 and GOP members did block that in the House, so... I guess there'll be another vote on Monday in that situation. Uh, Nancy Pelosi will try again, and we'll see. We'll see how all that goes. The president can actually do something called a pocket veto. Uh, I've, re- I've read about as well. Uh, if everybody is kind of adjourned and not there, and the president vetoes a thing, it might make it very complicated. So who knows? Who knows? Stimulus seemed like it was passed, but it's not. And yet uh, a lot of people who agree with the president, people that are not necessarily ones to agree with him, are now criticizing him uh, in an odd way or just dead silent on it much like a lot of conservatives, much like a lot of Republicans are kind of dead silent on this issue, too. A lot of it tied to what's going on in Georgia, but that is that is the world in which we live. All right, let's shift gears to uh, topics that are not about that kind of stuff because it's it's a holiday and I need topics that are not about that kind of stuff. Uh, I love this this headline, a four-minute, a four-last-minute Christmas gift ideas that feel like they're not last minute. So if you are, if you maybe you were debating whether or not you wanted to be with people this holiday season, and maybe you didn't do the Christmas shopping, or if you're just a, a Christmas Eve shopper, uh, which is something that I'm not admitting here, but I might be. I might be the kind of person who waits till the last minute to pick up my gifts. These are four ideas from the experts that you can get that never seem, and I, I definitely have issues with some of these expert uh, ideas, uh, but they never seem like last minute. The first one is booze. And the only way in which booze ever feels last minute is if it's not closed. That's just the only way in which you wonder if somebody was like, all right, you pluck this out of your fridge. And even though it looks like it's full or maybe you poured some water in it to get it all the way there, I can tell that this was open before you got it here. Uh, That's the only way. Other than that, they're right. If I showed up to any party or any family gathering and my gift to a loved one is booze, not only can I pull that off easily if I know my family members or my friends well enough to pick a product they like, but it, it can appear as though I didn't buy it right away. The second one, which I would never buy for anyone, by the way, I think this is odd. I think this is the kind of thing you get for yourself a lot more than, than people buy for you. 
I just I, I envision like the the act of opening it up. Like somebody gave me a gift, whether it's a family member or a friend, and they're like, "Here's a Christmas gift for you, a pet toy." They say that this would never look like it wasn't planned, and that is true. However, I would more wonder why the hell they plan to get me the pet toy as a gift for me, even if I love my pet, even if I'm thrilled that my dog or my cat or whatever, I don't know, a fish now has a wonderful new product for my my family member and or friend who just gifted it to me. It would be an odd thing to open. You open it up and it's a squeaky toy. For a second, you're like, wait, is this for me? No, 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 this is for my dog. Okay, that's fine. Uh, it's still not necessarily good. Uh, pop culture knickknacks and experiences, they say, are another thing on the list. Maybe buy people tickets to something that's coming into town. Maybe there's like a Star Wars themed event or something and you have a, a family member like that. It's easy. Pop in online, punch that in. Maybe even just concert tickets for whenever those things come back. I pray sooner rather than later. Uh, this wouldn't feel last minute. It would seem like it was planned and valuable depending on where the seats are, too. If you buy somebody fancy concert tickets, you're like, ah, I just got you the new tickets to see the Bruce Springsteen uh, tour for his latest CD, uh, his latest album. Where am I located? Well, you're in the real, you're pretty high up there. I mean, that would make me feel like maybe it was a little last minute. At the same time, depending on how well I know someone, I'm not expecting all of my friends and family to buy me front row seats to any event that's coming up. Uh, But this is a good idea. Then the last one to me is the one that makes the least sense. If you didn't plan out the holiday, if you don't have a gift prepared for, for someone you care about and you go this road, I think almost everybody knows you got this on the way over to my house. And they say a gift card, a gift card of any kind, whether it's Amazon, Best Buy, any of them, restaurant gift card, what have you. And in 2020, you can even spin that. Be like, man, restaurants have been struggling. So I got these gift cards and I just wanted to give them to everybody this holiday season because I care about you and I care about this restaurant I love. But come on, you always know the gift card. That's like money. My mom, by the way, is famous for just giving money to people. She's like, I don't know. I don't know what you want this holiday season. Here's some money. And honestly, it's not a bad gift. I don't hate it all. I vividly actually remember a birthday I had as a kid. I was having a bunch of uh, friends over, and they were asking me, like, what I wanted presents-wise. And I asked my mother. I'm like, what do we want presents-wise for my, my birthday? And I'm turning, like, eight or nine. And she's like, money. Ask all your friends for money. And I remember everybody in school, and especially the parents of the kids who came to my birthday, started to feel like maybe we weren't doing so well financially because when they all heard back that I, as an eight-year-old child, had asked for cash, I don't even think I wanted checks. I'm like, can you guys just bring cash over? And by the way, at the time, I'm on the East Coast. I'm an Italian from New Jersey, and I'm asking everybody to hand me an envelope with some cash in it for my little birthday. You know, shake the hand, say good job to me. That, that was an odd experience, but it's just always been the M.O., and there's nothing wrong with that. Not that there's anything wrong with it. Getting cash as a holiday gift is great. Getting a check, it's lovely. You can spend that on anything you want. It's what we should all do. All of us should give money to people way more often. And yet on that day, it seemed like it was wrong. All right, this is Craig Collins filling in on the Chad Benson Show. Merry Christmas Eve. This is the Chad Benson Show. Independent thoughts, independent life. This is Chad Benson. This is the Chad Benson Show. My name is Craig Collins filling in. And on Christmas Eve, I might as well tell you about some gift ideas out there in the world. Uh, A couple German sisters created a board game that has sold out uh, about 2,000 copies. So I guess they they need to make more board games because that's not that many. It's a coronavirus board game. It's called Corona. According to the outlet, the point of the game is to buy all the groceries on the shopping list before an older neighbor who is staying home uh, for, excuse me, for an older neighbor. Thank God. The way I misread that for a second was going to make me mad. Uh, but you're buying everything on the shopping list for an older neighbor who has to stay at home and avoid uh, shopping during the coronavirus. And you have to deal with other unruly uh, shoppers while picking up all the items on the list. Up to four people can play. Uh, and they deliver all the different items, obstacles, things that you have to overcome in order to get through uh, the pandemic or at least your shopping experience successfully. Even though it's sold out, 2,000 copies, and it's being talked about on Fox and other places, so I'm now talking about it here. 
I have no interest ever in my life in playing a board game, video game, anything connected to coronavirus, to be honest with you. And I know that I'm taking the sensitive guy approach to this, and I know that's not going to be popular with everybody, but even the SNL bit, the coronavirus bit that a lot of people thought was funny, uh, my first reaction is that it, it might have been a tad too soon to make jokes as coronavirus is uh, talking about their experience this holiday season. And this game, although certainly uh, created 100% in, a, in an, a way to be, you know, anything other than disrespectful, I just would have no interest in playing it. If you went home for the holiday with everything that we're dealing with, every conversation, they're talking about new strands, new mutant strands of coronavirus in, in places like Nigeria, just out there in the world that that is scaring the crap out of a bunch of people, and that's not fake news. Sadly, that is real news. But if I go home for the holiday and someone busts out the coronavirus video game or board game, I shatter it over my feet and I leave the party. I don't know. I that's not that's not a thing I'm into, especially if you explain the rules. And by the way, have you done that on Christmas Day? This is the ultimate test of your relationship with a loved one. It can be a significant other, it can just be family members. But someone in a family on Christmas, and maybe more people not going to see family members and avoiding this horrible interaction is good for all of us. Someone's gonna get gifted a brand new board game. And board games today are silly, much like the coronavirus one in which they have a bunch of rules and weird things that make them way more complicated than Monopoly uh, to play, and someone in the family is going to ask everybody to play it, and you're going to feel real bad if that gift was given to a child. You're going to be like, all right, I'll I'll play the board game. And you know that there's someone also very competitive in your family that's going to explain the rules and take them very seriously. I seriously didn't talk to my brother, uh, one of the closest people, one of the closest members of my family, one of the the people I I interact with all the time in my life for like a couple months after a Christmas experience with a board game. And, like, we talked, but it wasn't the same because of how terrible it got. There was a time toward the end of it where he was throwing pieces at me, telling me that I was just trying to hurt him. Like, I didn't care about any of the other people playing. That's a real story. And so maybe, maybe a good part, a silver lining in the fact that some people are going to stay home this holiday season is that no one's going to buy coronavirus, the board game, and no one's going to bust out the brand-new board game for kids and then get in a fight that lasts a while. And we could have talked. I mean, we both thought we were right, uh, by the way, which is the other horrible part and all that. All right, let's shift gears and not focus on that too much. Um, Pope Francis keeps getting criticized for the way in which he utilizes his social media account. And to be honest, out of all the things, and I mean this, you know, not necessarily as a joke, but just honestly, all the things that are controversies that come from the Catholic Church, this one feels like it's getting way too much attention. Like, I just, I really don't care if the Pope who has 7.5 million followers on Instagram, makes some odd likes uh, decisions when it comes to like photos out there. He, I guess months ago, had liked a photo of, of a, a female actress, is what I will say. Uh, the photo wasn't you know anything that's inappropriate for uh, social media. It was, it was social media friendly, but it was, it was uh, an interesting photo for the Pope to be down with. Uh, he has done it again. There's a brand new photo that I guess he has liked out on social media, and people wind up noticing this, and it goes viral because the Pope's account pops up as one of the likes. And it's not totally easy to figure that out. Uh, I don't think there's like a news feed on Instagram like other places, so it takes you a little longer to realize who it is. Uh, but this is a woman in a tight black swimsuit, as it's described here, uh, that's showing off her, you know, uh, attractive or, or sculpted body, whatever the word you want to choose is. And the Pope liked it. And I, I don't know if he's just liking like, you know, people who are, are physically fit. In, in the year that we've had, maybe he's just trying to encourage some different things. Uh, but people are reacting to this for the second time, as I said. And, and I, I, I think we need to get over this one. I think with everything else going on in the world, everything else that the Catholic Church has obviously um, dealt with and whatnot, that if the Pope is going to like some some female risque photos on Instagram, not fully inappropriate photos. And maybe I'm totally wrong. And at times, actually, because I'm I'm a Catholic and I've talked about being a Catholic on the radio, I've been brought on as the the character Catholic Craig on some of the shows that I've been a part of to give my take on something in the news as far as as Catholicism is concerned. And out of all the things that have been in the news, as I said, this one is one that I feel like we can all just get over. We can put behind us. We can ignore the fact that the Pope has gone a little rogue. And it's probably not him. The other thing that's so important to mention, by the way, is that I doubt the Pope runs his own Instagram. I mean... (laughs) There's not a lot of people in the Pope's age group that are doing a lot of Instagram-y things in general. And then if you put celebrity on top of it, and certainly the Pope is a, an important religious figure, but also a celebrity, usually there's other people. There's, there's other people involved who can run those pages for you. So I think the problem here 
is that whatever not, you know, uh, major person in the world of the Catholic Church, but I, I don't think it's called an intern, but I don't know what it would be that would be running his, his social media page, is just forgetting to log out of his page and log into theirs when they're liking these racy photos that they're liking on, on social media. And the whole world reports it. And the Pope, I don't know if he's actually responded to any of this stuff yet, uh, but truthfully, it's probably just some person, some young person, running his account that's forgetting to log out and liking some of the photos. Although I don't even know how they're seeing them, by the way. That means they're searching for it anyway. Let's move on to other stories so I don't dive too much deeper into that. I saw that an entrepreneur uh, is building a 600-square-foot floating sea mansion. Uh, this is a real story. It's out of China. Uh, the mansion will only cost about $61,000 to build, um, which is amazing in and of itself. Uh, and, and it's out there in the middle of the ocean, out there in the, on the sea, uh, for him to just kind of hang out. Uh, one night in 2018, while drinking with a friend who also happened to be an architect, the two guys started talking about how great it would be to build a really sweet home, uh, <laughs> to, to really up the ante of the boathouse in all the ways you possibly can. So that's something that's now going down and obviously going viral because of the pandemic, because of quarantine. Uh, this is a way to definitely be away from others. I'm not super excited about whenever there's a horrible storm of some kind because the house does look pretty nice and a lot of it is hardwood. And I imagine that's not the kind of stuff you want to see get soaking wet. Uh, but, hey, it only costs you some some amount of money. For mansions, as far as they go, this would be much lower priced than most of the, the numbers we hear thrown around when somebody puts something for sale here in the United States. So to give it a try, 600 square foot floating sea mansion, $61,000. I don't know. I think I'm on board. And one other water-related story because I guess I'm doing that before I take a break here in a bit. There's a guy that got jailed um, because during the quarantine, during, um, you know, the pandemic, he chose to go visit his his girlfriend. And the way in which he did it was unique. Uh, He took a jet ski. He took a jet ski out for four hours to to visit his partner. Uh, The guy's name is Dale. So he went to go see Jessica, and he got in quite a bit of trouble for seeing Jessica. But they decided, because of the holiday, that they're going to let this guy out. I don't know if he jet skied his way out, which I would hope, is what happened, but they're like, you know, it's the holiday season, and we put this guy behind bars because he wanted to go visit a someone uh, that probably, you know, if you got a little bit lonely, it'd be nice to go to go see the girlfriend for a bit. But they described the whole situation as bittersweet to begin with. So the the girlfriend is overjoyed. The guy is obviously very happy to be out. Everybody is happy that the story has a very odd, you know, twist, but a very happy ending in the fact that for Christmas, jet ski guy gets to be out. He does need to do a bit of a joyride, just a little tiny, a quick one, just not by the police office or anything else, but he needs to have Jessica hop on the back of the jet ski and at least do a few donuts close to their area and then go home, in my opinion. Uh, But hopefully that doesn't wind up being a terrible idea. It's probably a terrible idea. But social media is going to love it, man. They're going to love it as much as the Pope liking a a photo that you wouldn't think the Pope would like. But again, uh, just to hit on that story before I take a break, I very much doubt the Pope is the one in charge of his Instagram account. I could be wrong. But of all the things I would bet on going into 2021, and if I had thrown bets out before this year, I would have got them all wrong. But going into next year, I can guarantee you that there is a 0% chance the Pope is the one who actually clicked the like button. And yet I could be wrong. And maybe we'll get the Pope on. We'll get his, uh, his Excellency on the show to talk about that in some detail in the future. All right, got to take a break. A lot more coming up in a bit. Craig Collins filling in on the Chad Benson Show. Me too. Hashtag immigration reforms. Hashtag help. I'm trapped in a hashtag factory and I can't get out. The Chad Benson Show. This is the Chad Benson Show. My name is Craig Collins filling in. Do you know your shopping terms for COVID-19, the 2020 uh, time in which we're all alive? There are some new shopping terms out there that are very relevant today. And I, I guess this is just a quick quiz for you to take it home. Uh, do you know these? The first one is guilt gifting. This is a term that's being used a lot. 40% of consumers plan to purchase more gifts to bring joy to those that they know are are experiencing challenging times. This would be the guilt gifting pandemic or the guilt gifting uh, response to the pandemic, I should say. Uh, It refers to spending money on gifts because you know that that someone in your life could use it. The motivation is enough to make a a mark on your credit card for sure. Uh, Purchasing is up. One reason they say why is the guilt gifting. Another one is revenge shopping. This is actually not as Shakespearean or whatever as it sounds. Uh, Pent-up demand is what fuels these purchases. Perhaps the revenge is of fate. 
uh, which can keep people stuck inside indoors, keep people from going to their favorite locations, doing all kinds of things. So a lot of people are revenge shopping, and I know a few people that are doing this on a fairly regular basis. The term first came to force uh, over the spring, in which the the phenomenon might have been being used more in China than anywhere else, as they were one of the first places to experience some version of quarantine. I don't feel too bad uh, about that for for them there. I guess revenge shopping, that's totally fine. Another one, a BOP or B-O-P-I-S, uh, which I guess is also a Filipino dish, but that's not what this refers to. If you see this on a checkout of any kind, on any kind of shopping that you're doing, it actually means you're going to buy online, but you're going to pick up in store. Buy online, pick up in sp- store is B-O-P-I-S. Uh, this is a very unique thing that obviously we didn't do a whole lot of uh, pre-pandemic, but probably a template for how a lot of companies will continue to see success even post-pandemic. Uh, places like Walmart can do this fairly easily, and everybody always thought this is the way you beat an Amazon, is not only do you allow people to buy things from the comfort of their own home, but they can go get it that day from one of the stores different than other places, and you don't have to have it shipped to you. But buy online, pick up in store, one of the terms that's very much used now uh, that hadn't been used before. The last one is PVOD, uh, which sounds like something I would not want to catch from any individual, but PVOD is premium video on demand. A lot of people are buying videos, uh, movies, all kinds of things on demand more so than ever before. Uh, so companies are offering this. It's going to be crazy. This Friday, and I think this is going to happen a lot now, uh, Wonder Woman, the new movie, Wonder Woman like 1984, whatever it's called, is going to be available on a streaming platform, HBO Max, the same day it hits theaters. Theaters are obviously very upset about this because it's been pretty hard to get people to go to movie theaters in general this year. And if that's the kind of thing that continues for all these different streaming platforms, and now there's like 7,000 streaming platforms and only going to be more of them if every movie house, every creator of content is capable of putting out their own streaming service. But it is a unique ad value. You know, to be honest, I, I'm going to watch that movie. Not because I, I tremendously love the Wonder Woman movies, although I do think they're pretty good. And I am a bit of a hero nerd. I uh, love myself Marvel more than DC. But it's a brand new movie. And it's going to hit my my television on Friday, the same day it's out in a movie theater. And I can just pop a popcorn. And by the way, I love going to movie theaters. I love getting the popcorn. I love the experience. I don't want that to go away, but it's brand new and I, I just have to click play. And I'm pretty sure if you already have HBO Max, which I do, you don't have to pay extra. There's been some other uh, notable movies that were released on streaming platforms where you had to pay like 20, 30 bucks just to get the movie to the premium video on demand. Uh, this would not be the case. So I don't know if this is the kind of thing that changes. And actually, if I'm going to do this topic, I might as well hit on this too. Uh, most people are going to be very happy never to shake your hand again. Yet another result of the world in which we lived over the past year 30% of respondents, when asked the question, would you be happy if handshakes go away forever, said, yeah, that'd be awesome. Let's not, I don't know if that we replace it with like the bro high five or something, if there's some version of interaction still, or if you met people and you just never physically interacted with any of them, which would be very odd. 30% of people were, were absolutely less likely to handshake and very happy about that. 26% said that it wouldn't seem all that bad to have the handshake go away. So that's over 50% of people. Uh, and 54% did agree that, you know, changing things because of what we've experienced in 2020 makes a lot of sense, which it does, uh, even though I guess at some point, hopefully, there's vaccines and cures and people who are immune because, sadly, they've gotten it but gotten over it, which most people get over it. So hopefully we get into the world where this is behind us. And then I don't know. I don't know if we all go back to it. Business travelers wanted to stay grounded as much as possible, too. 40% of respondents, when asked if their business will travel less in the coming years because of the way in which they maybe did more remote uh, uh, connections this year, uh, 40% of respondents said that would be awesome to travel very little or never at all. 51% said they would probably travel only a few times a year for a business now, as opposed to maybe those who travel very often. And again, that there's probably pros and cons of that. It might sound great now, and I've never been uh, one that has a job that makes you travel all that often. I've always been luckily able to do a lot of my gigs from the comfort of the places I'm already in. Uh, but when you do that kind of stuff, I, I do wonder if maybe you start to forget some of the benefits of getting to go on the road and see some places. Granted, probably not all of them the most scenic uh, that you're doing business in, but there's there's got to be a pro and a con there. Uh, people don't also necessarily want the office back to the degree we might have all expected. 43% of respondents, when asked if they'd like to see their office return entirely to normal with all the people in it that they had before and all that stuff, said no. 25% said they would like to see the office reper- return entirely to pre-pandemic normal kind of levels. And the most often reason given by those individuals is the the cabin fever you get when you live at home all the time. But the fact that it's so split and that 43% of 
uh, about twice as much or so as the people who want to see the, the office return don't want to see it return is interesting. 66% agreed that some sort of mixture uh, makes sense to them, at least, if not um, going one way or the other, if you can find something in the middle where you get to, to work from home more. And I do get that, too. Like, working from home, there, there's certain values in it, certain fun with it. Uh, so if you could just, like, shoot a, an email off to a boss and not actually call in sick on a day when maybe you're not all that ill, uh, but you could actually just say, hey, I'd like to do my work from home, as long as you get the work done, it might be very interesting. Although I've, I've also read another hot take out there, and I don't even have this in front of me. This is the worst way to do this, but it is true. It's been out there at least once, that this could be the end of cities as we know them. Most people who move to big cities try to get jobs with big companies because, you know, that's where those jobs are. If everything becomes online, if you... Could you envision a world in which you never met your boss in person? Not once, not one time. And I'm sure some people have experienced it this year, but I mean ever. I mean, if you're a longtime person who works for a company, say, five, ten years, you just never meet the person who hired you, the person who you work for, not one time. That would be surreal, and yet we're barreling toward those kind of things if we keep going this way in which we're going. And I don't know. I don't know what reverses it. I don't know if the news that things are over uh, changes us back to those, those regular levels. Uh, But this holiday season, at least, I think that maybe we should consider that things were pretty good about a year ago. All right, Craig Collins filling in on the Chad Benson Show. More in a bit. The Chad Benson Show. Independent thoughts, independent life. This is Chad Benson. This is the Chad Benson Show. Happy holidays. My name is Craig Collins. Merry Christmas. I'm not scared to say it, unlike some of the places might be. Uh, I have this story. This is uh, news that just entertains the crap out of me. And I can't, it's up on my social media page. I think we'll try to get it up on Chad's social media page one way or another. Uh, but it's a story that's, that's definitely captured my attention for a while now. Uh, Jetpack guy. Jetpack guy is this dude in California who torments LAX for whatever reason, flying around on a jetpack. I don't know if he made it himself. I don't know if he bought it from a company. I think at one point it might have come out that the guy who's doing it does own a company that makes jetpacks. Um, but people weren't totally sure that everything's happening the way that pilots described. There was audio of people saying they saw somebody fly by in a jetpack. Now there is video, thanks to someone on a flight, some passenger uh, on a flight that threw it up on Instagram. And as I said, it's shared on the Facebook page at the Craig Collins show. Um, But the guy flies, he whizzes by at a speed that just, and by the way, out of all the things that I grasped from this video, other than the fact that Jetpack guy is real and that made my heart happy, is just how fearless this human being seems. I mean, 2020 has been a challenging, challenging year, and a whole lot of people have dealt with things they probably never anticipated dealing with. But if this dude who has access to a Jetpack just kind of casually whips by planes now, I, he's in airspace that is trafficked. It's not exactly like he's just flying above his own house, just taking a, I don't know if this is because he needs attention. I don't, there's so many questions and so few answers provided by the video. Uh, but if you wanted proof that Jetpack guy is a human being, and this better not be some sort of uh, elaborate video hoax uh, that Jimmy Kimmel has put me on again, but, if, but this is out there and it's in the world, and I think it's just tremendous to see. And I can't imagine what it's like to be that guy. But actually, you know what? Truthfully. This year in 2020, I know the service he should provide. This, he would sell out every single day all the time. He should do one-off jetpack rides the same way like people jump out of a plane and skydive. If you can tandem it, that's fine. If you can train me how to do it on my own, even better uh, to everybody. Everybody should get one. Maybe we add it to the stimulus package. If we can't get more than 600 bucks in the stimulus, if we can't hit the $2,000 that the president would like to see, everybody gets a one-off jetpack ride. You just get one. You don't have to take it this year. You can hang on to it. You can have it whenever, but you get that in the mail along with your check for 600 bucks, a free voucher to ride on the jetpack just once uh, wherever you want to go. Because, okay, maybe we all wouldn't take it up on that. Maybe you could turn it in for, I don't know, something more responsible, but I would. I would, oh my God, I'd be on board. This is why I need to be elected to a a political office of some kind and then immediately have a scandal that kicks me out. Uh, Craig Collins is immediately leaving office after his proposal to have jetpacks for everyone. Uh, (laughs) 
in California after his idea was shot down by every single human being in the world of politics. He's the only one who thought it was a good idea, and he won't. Now he's on social media. I would Twitter the heck out of it. I would do everything the president would do by just barraging Twitter with all kinds of complaints about how, come on, guys, jetpacks make sense. Let's try it out. Anyway, moving on to news you might actually care about, uh, although I don't know if you care about this. Uh, there's been odd things that have made comebacks in the year in which we're having. There's been odd things that have been like huge surges on, uh, obviously, toilet paper is the one that comes to mind, that it was selling out all over the place. That's not a sentence I ever really thought I'd say. Uh, the baby pool was another one that always captivated me, that people who weren't going on vacation were buying up baby pools, not for children, so they could sit in their backyard in a baby pool and maybe sip a drink of some kind, a very sad version of vacation in the year in which it's been. Uh, but here's another one, another item that's going, you know, doing much better. And actually, even the the Floby, uh, which I just thought of and is not the story I'm about to talk about. And that's not even pandemic related, although I guess kind of to do your haircut at home. But it's really because of George Clooney that the Floby is sold out everywhere. But greetings cards, uh, greeting cards are making a comeback and, and holiday cards of all different kinds are making a comeback, not just, you know, the birthday card, uh, because people are really enjoying the idea of going somewhere even if they aren't somewhere. You used to get those cards in the mail all the time. You'd have family member, members that were traveling and going somewhere, and they'd send you that little card, like, oh, we're having a fun time here. Uh, those obviously don't sell very well anymore because a text message with a photo in it or something is more than enough to let me know what's going on. But all of these kind of cards are making a comeback, greeting cards, what have you, because people miss going places. And so... Because of that, the, the personalized ability to put photos of your puppies or anything on them or just to have experiences uh, via the, the photo that's on the card is something that's tremendously valuable to so many people and not something we really saw making a comeback, I guess. I also love this story just because the headline hits home for me and maybe a lot of people. Five easy Christmas cookies to make and then eat entirely on your own this holiday season if you have to do it. I have mentioned before, I think on this show and on the radio other places, that I'm alone this holiday season, and I'm not trying to get anybody to feel bad for me. You don't need to send me a Facebook message being like, it's okay, Collins, you're going to make it through. It's My wife had some family stuff. She had family members that had health things, so she had to go be with her family, and then she's continued to be with her family uh, for a couple months. We're fine, by the way. Not that anyone was asking, and that's an odd thing to just throw out there on the radio, but we're good. Talk all the time, but she's not going to be home for the holidays, so I am. We don't have any kids. We don't have any pets. I'm doing this whole thing alone, um, and so I've made some odd food decisions. Uh, But before I get into that, I guess I can go through this list of different items you should make as far as cookies go that you can eat alone. And maybe this is as self-serving as any segment I've ever done on radio because this is this is me. I'm debating which of these five is the right one to go with. They say the holiday shortbread cookie uh, with some royal icing on it is one that might be delicious to have in in vast quantities alone. A coconut macaron uh, with a blossom on the top. That's way too hard for me to make. Look, I'm not a cook. I'm not an expert. I can't bake things. These are very difficult. The butter snowball is another one that does seem like you just jam a lot of things together in in sort of the same way you pack a snowball and just cook that. So maybe that's the road I go. Eggnog cookies with eggnog icing. Uh, By the way, I think eggnog personally is a terrible product. I think it's gross and tastes bad. (laughs) I think I've called it a trash product before, and that's just me, my own opinion. I won't be making the eggnog cookie. Uh, And I do think that those would be way too overwhelming to eat a lot of if you cook them all for just yourself. And the last one is the cranberry orange shortcake cookie, uh, which is also out there in the world. And I guess one of the better options because the shortbread is something that's a little bit lighter. Uh, but here's why I brought up the stuff about my, my wife, not to make everybody feel sad for me, not to take a weird turn on the radio on my own, but because I've been making weird food decisions too. The, the thing is, if you go to the grocery store and you're buying for just one, which is the first time in my life I've ever really been doing that. I had roommates and stuff in college. We used to split grocery bills like responsible people so you could buy a bunch of different items, even just a pizza. Getting a frozen pizza to eat alone is an odd experience because <laughs> I don't I don't really want all the pizza every time, but sometimes I do. And so I was at the grocery store the other day, and I, I know this is such a dovetail, probably not a valuable conversation. I just want to tell somebody, and so you guys on the radio listening are now the people I get to tell. And I saw a clearance item, and I don't know if your brain works like mine. Clearance items are always more attractive. If I'm in a grocery store, if it's food that I'll consume, And if it's staggeringly low in price, it makes me want to buy it. The problem was it was frozen macaroni and cheese, and it was the family size. It serves 10 people, a giant thing of macaroni and cheese. And I I lie to you not. This is absolutely true. I stood in that grocery store for five to 10 minutes 
staring at the massive macaroni and cheese, which was so reduced in price, it was less expensive than the individual size, and telling myself I shouldn't buy it, then purchasing it, and last night I cooked it for myself, and I ate just macaroni and cheese for dinner like a small toddler, like a child, and I didn't even come close to finishing it. I got to tell you, one of the best gifts I've ever given to myself. So this year, in 2020, uh, for anyone that, on the off chance, just like me, I'm talking to, that winds up doing some of this experience alone, and I might have to go visit family so that I don't keep buying irresponsible products like this. And I saved it. Anyone who's worried about me throwing things out, the food is still in the fridge. I'm going to actually have it again tonight for my Christmas Eve celebration. But it's not a bad idea to be gluttonous, to be crazy gluttonous, just one or once or twice every so often to eat all the cookies you bake. I am I am on board with that. I am I'm on team you as far as 2020 goes where that is concerned because my experience was so great. I was eating it. You know, macaroni and cheese is a comfort food. It's delicious. And I was just like there's no part of this that is bad. Anybody witnessing this would think I'm a terrible person. Luckily, no one's around. And then I made the choice for some reason to tell everybody on a national radio show. I don't know why I just did that. I think I'm going to take a break. My producer is telling me in my ear that things have gone rogue. I need to get, get the show back on the rails. I'm kidding. He's not doing that. So I'll be, I'll be back in a second. But if you can, treat yourself. Uh, go through the drive through and get one too many or seven too many items or buy a family-sized macaroni and cheese if it's on, on discount and really just enjoy the heck out of it because we all deserve at least one of those, just one, and a jetpack this holiday season. States? Uh, no. Deep doo-doo? Yeah. The Chad Benson Show. This is the Chad Benson Show. My name is Craig Collins. I just did a whole segment. You're not supposed to do this in radio, by the way. Remind people what you were just talking about, because the audience might be totally new. Can't help it. I just did a whole segment about the gluttony that I've been uh, uh, just very happy to be a part of in the year that is 2020. I have a giant family-sized macaroni and cheese uh, that I made last night for myself, half of it still waiting for me upstairs. And on cue, right as I'm talking about that, we go to a commercial break. A colleague of ours busts in the door, or I don't know, I'm actually not in the same location as, as amazing producer Phil is, and offered us candy. I can't partake because I'm not, as I said, on, on site with him. And Phil, you said no to candy? I am stuffed. I brought a whole bunch of food for me. I've got a big bag of food sitting next to me. I'm, uh, no. Honestly. What I just learned is I'm not convincing at all. I did an entire segment about how we should all be gluttonous, and someone threw free things at you, and you're like, nah, leave it alone. That was impressive. Your self-control is amazing, and yet I judge a little. Well, go right ahead and judge. Uh, I know. See, he doesn't care. That's what makes Phil so great. Thank you for jumping in, though, buddy. Uh, I have a lot of other stuff I want to talk to here in just another few minutes, but if someone comes back with candy, I am still very much game. Uh, I saw that the Washington football team, has had to deal with one of their players having an issue. Uh, Their quarterback, Dwayne Haskins, was caught at a strip club without a mask on. He's been stripped of his his captain title, uh, which is a little bit odd to me. I don't know why you got to go that far. He's also been fined $40,000. Social media posts demonstrated that he was out having, you know, a good time at a place that I think a lot of probably athletes wind up going. And so I just think this is so tremendously interesting that the reaction to it is, is as strong as it is. In the ways that it is, he's apologized for it. Did he make the right decision? No. I'm not going to argue that. I'm not going to tell you that the pardons by the president the other day are are correctly appropriate decisions to be made. Uh, but is it the most shocking of news stories this year? No. And does the does the punishment fit the crime? I don't know if it does. I, I guess I'd ask you to tell me how you feel about stories like this. And if you think the fun, punishment fits the crime and this sort of thing, uh, you can find us on our social media pages if you want to weigh in that way. But, but yes, I, I get it that the NFL, the NBA, all the different leagues, certainly ones without a bubble, are going to struggle with the different outbreaks, the different, uh, I guess, medical challenges, for lack of a better word, health challenges that we're dealing with this year. Uh, but as all of this goes on, as we find a way to navigate through all this, if you're not going to bubble, quarantine, lockdown, whatever it is, your league, I think there are players who are going to, you know, uh, live their life in different ways. And so I'm not, I'm not advocating. Again, I'm not saying that Dwayne Haskins made a smart decision when he hit, of all things, a strip club and did it without a mask on, although everybody wearing masks in that environment would be just as odd as, as going to one right now. Uh, but to be stripped of your captainship, to be, 
to be fined and admitted 40K is not that much for an athlete, I don't think. Uh, but to have all that happen, uh, it does seem like you're, you're taking a, a interesting approach to that. But this is me, and I'm sure I'm very much in the minority for making this argument about forgiveness as opposed to anything else. Uh, but the year's been hard. It's been hard on everybody. And I guess uh, we all have our own ways to cope with that. I saw this story, too. And I know we all know people that as I read this story, you immediately think that's not true. That's not accurate at all. No way, shape, or form. Uh, a UK study has demonstrated that our brains have a GPS within them. They have what is almost essentially like the thing in your in your phone that maps out places you've been before, maps out ways to get places. It even has a, a odometer, it says, that gives you a, a sensitive amount of the distance. These are all things your brain cells kind of functioning maybe through conditioning of using his, uh, GPS as often as we all do. But I know tremendous amounts of people that this doesn't seem remotely true for, myself included. Unfortunately, I've become addicted to my phone's GPS, and I am one of the millennials that get often derided by people of other generations. I can't get anywhere. I, I have had to move from one city to another for a job, and it's taken me way longer than it used to take to learn the ins and outs of said city because I navigate home using a GPS, not just other places. It takes me like a few months to learn how to get home from some locations without popping my GPS in. So I'm sorry, UK study, and I, I admit that I just embarrassed myself in front of all of you here. You can judge, I accept it, that that this is not accurate for everyone. I think some of us have this broken, and if we can put it back in the brain, that might be a nice thing to do, uh, but we can't. All right, I, I know that they're serious topics. I know that, that they deserve to be talked about at least a little bit, uh, no matter where we are in the show, I guess. So I, I should hit on some of the serious things, and yet I can't. You know what I'm going to do? I'm actually going to revisit something else uh, that I talked about earlier on in the show. And I, I want your judge's ruling. I'd love for someone to go out there and tell me. Uh, this is interesting to me. I don't know about to you. Uh, scientists, after discovering things about our brain, things about all kinds of stuff this year, have also found these seals deep in the ocean that are communicating in a very strange way we don't have any reason why it could sound alien to some sci-fi to others like Star Wars to the people who wrote this post. And we're not going to worry about it. We're going to take a time out from being concerned about the new way seals are interacting with each other and communicating and the noises they're making in the depths of the ocean. But, you know, if you want to go conspiracy theory on this and say that aliens are real because of these computery noises that are coming out of creatures, I'm fine with that, too. I want to give you a taste of what it sounds like, because, again, to me, this is... This is as interesting of a story as we get in this year, and, and I know people disagree, but I don't care. Just to interrupt real quick, that is not computers. That is not some sort of like sci-fi movie being created. This is two seals, two animals swimming deep in the ocean, communicating with each other by making these noises from their faces. That is weird. Every part of that's weird. I think that if the, the year hasn't been what it's already been, that we'd be way more disturbed by that than any of us are right now, and yet nobody can handle it. All of our all of our weirdness, uh, you know, or just ability to tolerate any sort of strange things going on in the world, they're, they're totally full. All of our gauges, we can't put anything else in them. So alien seal? Nah, I'll wait for the next year to deal with that. Oh, by the way, I am thrilled that this is true. I'm thrilled that the, the jetpack guy is true. You can find the video on Facebook.com slash Craig Collins Show. The guy from LAX, the guy tormenting people. Uh, the social media video is just incredible. I know I touched on it a second ago, but I really want to share the video, and I can't on the platform I'm on. Uh, but it's just so awesome that, that there's a guy out there. And, and I honestly do wonder now, too, like what other inventions probably were made in somebody's basement uh, during this year that might not be out there yet. Like, did someone create a full-on Batmobile operating in all capacities? Is that somewhere out there? Uh, these are stories that will lift my spirits on this holiday to know just, and there actually is this other very beautiful story of a woman. This is sad, the sad way to end the show, but I guess it's a little uplifting too. Uh, a woman who lost her, her husband, uh, very upset about it, obviously, this year, uh, but she did something really sweet, really perfect, and, and it's very on, on point for the holiday too. She turned his glasses into an ornament for her Christmas tree, and you got to look that up. I'll put that up on my Facebook page too. Uh, she lost her husband. She wanted a way to remember him, a way to celebrate the holiday with him this year. And so turning glasses into an ornament is the first ornament that someone's told me they made by hand that I truly love. Most of the time someone tells you like, oh, we made that. You can tell. You're like, all right, that's, uh, you know, okay. If the kids made that in school, that's great. It's not that kind of thing. This is a lovely touching story of a woman that wanted to, 
to, to still spend the holiday feeling, you know, as close to someone she cared about as she could. And so I think we should all do that more, too. I think that we probably should find ways to remember those we love. And Christmas ornament makes sense to me. This is Chad Benson Show. My name is Craig Collins filling in. This is the Chad Benson Show.